2022 uh, select board meeting at the Steel Community Room. Uh, I welcome all the guests and everyone in, in attendance. I uh, just want to remind people of a couple of things. Uh, every time you, and including the folks out in, in Zoom land, if you have something to say, please have it go through the chair. It's just good protocol to, to do that. Have uh, information flow through that and be and be recognized by the by the chair before someone speaks. That will keep things in running order. And the only thing I thought it was kind of very apropos. I don't know whose car it is, but on the back of their car, they had a little sticker that says "Be nice." That's and my it, car. And, 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 and in this and in this day and age. I couldn't say something better with everything <laughs> happening in the world and things. Be nice is a very appropriate thing. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, first thing is we need to uh, approve the agenda. Does anyone have any uh, changes to the agenda? I do, Mike. If we could add an entertainment permit for the music in the alley series. Underneath consent or uh, as a discussion piece? Um, probably, I need to give you the dates. Yeah, so. Okay, let's do it as a discussion because it's... Can't be a consent agenda unless it's on the consent yeah. Right. What was the name of that again? Music in the Alley. Music in the Alley. Any other additions? There being none, can I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Um, Thank you. Awesome. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? If not, motion to approve the agenda. Aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. Vote to approve the agenda. Thank you. <laughs> I got there. Long weekend. Aye. <laughs> uh, next on the agenda is a consent agenda item. The only item is the minutes of the May 16th meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items? I'll move to approve the consent agenda items. Thank you, Roger. Do we have a second? Oh, second. Thank you, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a motion and a second. Any uh, further discussion? There being none, uh, vote to approve the consent agenda item. Aye. 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 Okay. Now, just the next, the next part of the meeting is the uh, time for the public to comment. And the public portion, portion of our meeting is solely for things that are not specific agenda items. As if you want to comment on a specific agenda item, we will get to those agenda items at that point in time. But if anyone has something to say that's not on the agenda, we would love to hear from you. There being none, any out in Zoom land? There being none, uh, we will then move on. We'll move on to select board items. Uh, we'll move on to uh, John Malter and Procarians on the Not Quite Independence Day uh, celebration. I'm gonna turn the helm over to Danny because I'm a Rotarian, so I, have, I should uh, abstain from, especially because I'm on the festival committee, so I probably should abstain. Thanks. Thanks. Would you like me to come up? Yes, please. Yes. Come on up. I want to uh, modify your bumper sticker. <laughs> Should be, be nice and recycle. <laughs> <laughs> See, that way I can get the plug in for solid waste. You know, that's, 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 that's a friendly amendment. <laughs> <friendly. laughs> <laughs> I know, that's right. We'll vote on that I, next. I just, I, I feel uncomfortable because this is not my normal coming to the, uh, to the board here. Got it off track. Oh, anyway. That was so good. Anyway, yes, greetings sir. and uh, thank you for having me and us. And uh, I'm happy to report that uh, NQID is moving along and we've got hopefully everything but the weather is under control. <laughs> we will hopefully see that as being done as well. June 25th is. Uh, our scheduled date for NQID. Uh, 
we have all of our traffic control and security taken care of between the, uh, both the troopers and we have two Washington County sheriffs uh, in support roles as well for the event. Uh, parade is scheduled for, uh, for, for five o'clock and uh, we'll go through uh, on that. And then we have our vendors coming over to Rusty Parker Park. They'll be setting up uh, earlier in the afternoon. And we have a, a concert scheduled from six to about nine o'clock with Barbie and the Bones. And we will be providing or selling uh, beer uh, through an application that we have made to the liquor control uh, department that Carla has the application that will need to be approved by this August board in June. And uh, we have additional porta potties. We have a, a 15 yard roll off for additional uh, trash and hopefully some recycling will occur as well. And uh, we will be uh, putting the fence around the, uh, the park early on Saturday morning. We will be uh, blocking some of the parking later in the evening on Friday night so that the food trucks will have no impediment there as we get started for Saturday. Uh, we will have cleanup done before 11 o'clock on Sunday. I know there's another event that's going to be happening at the park on Sunday. And with that, I would just, and then we've got the fireworks that'll be happening at dark. And uh, we have another uh, coordination piece with the buildings and grounds department with the state. Teresa Woods taking care of that. And the transportation agency has been informed for whatever their permit is for the road closure and the parade. So hopefully, you know, we, we always throw a lot of balls up in the air and hopefully we catch more than is necessary, but we don't like to have anything drop. <laughs> and I'm now open for questions. Sean, are there any big changes from last year to this year in terms of either the physical space or event? No, uh, I think that uh, we may have hopefully more participating uh, parade uh, uh, events. Uh, I'm hoping we get more people coming out because of the uh, change in the, uh, the COVID situation. And I like to think this is going to be a great starting point for Waterbury's wonderful summer. Thanks. So. Other questions? Is five o'clock uh, later than you've started in the past, or is mm -hmm. five o'clock been your standard? No, we have the uh, the Green Mountain Mile that starts at uh, four o'clock, okay. and that we didn't have the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and so and we're going to have Tammy. John, are you an hour off on yeah, everything? I think you're Am I an hour off? Is it? Yeah. No, it starts at 4. The parade is at 4. Oh, 345. The mile only takes about 15 yep. minutes or so. Okay, well, it's, it's not a half marathon. I was, I was thinking of me running, and so <laughs> it would be an hour. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. I, wanted to, I just wanted to make sure you were paying attention. And I was thinking, Roger, years ago it was earlier, it was closer to, to noon, oh, yeah. and then there was. Yeah. And the a a long break, just. and it was kind of a lull, so it kind of didn't work that well. This way, it compresses all of that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's probably what, what you're thinking. It was, it used to be, I think, new. Yeah, see, I've got the sheriffs coming in a little after three. Uh, they are going to be blocking South Main Street at about 3.30. The race, I think, is supposed to start at 345 and once all the racers go by that south sheriff will move up to demerit place and any cars that are coming north on main street will be diverted to go behind uh, 
uh, the coffee roasters and go north on Stowe Street or out to the uh, interstate or what have you, so that we've got that. And the other sheriff will be uh, stationed at the railroad overpass and blocking that side. It's two uh, Troopers will be at Park Row and Stowe Street, and we'll have several Rotarians on Winooski Street to complement everything else. Other questions? Any charge for the concert? Uh, the there's the concert? No, no specific charge. We always invite people to make donations. Hmm. As with anything, we try to uh, you know, enhance everybody's experience. Uh, none of the things, we have several elements in the parade that are a little pricey, but uh, I think they're uh, entertainment that is definitely appreciated by the folks. So that's a part of the equation. We're rotary. If we don't ask for donations, something's wrong. Got it. So what, um, what are we specifically Three. approving for, for a motion? festival permit for June 25th? Festival permit. So a motion to approve the festival permit for NQID on June 25th. I'll second it. I, I'm not making the motion. Oh, okay, I'll make that motion. Thank you so much. And then I'll wait for a second. I can second it. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank Aye. you so much. I abstain. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, I should have said Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Josh. All right, Mike, back to you, sir. Okay. Uh, Next item on the agenda is to discuss the traffic control concerns on Little River Road. Um, I know this has been kind of an ongoing, do you want to? Yeah, so um, uh, there have been several emails to me and I'm sure to most of you from um, folks on Little River Road. A couple of them are here tonight, I believe. So I think probably best to let uh, the folks from Little River have their say, and then you can ask questions, and I can make comments. Okay. Let's come up. Come on. Yes, please. All right. Hi. Um, just, just if you could say your name. I thought you wanted to email it. Nice oh, to meet you, you all. Oh, okay. uh, I'm Amanda Mello, and I've been on Little River Road for seven years this August. My name is Allison Schleppi. I've been there for about 15 years. So we're here today to talk about an ongoing issue with speeding on our road. Um, we've been here in the past, um, I think it was last summer, um, and every summer so far we've had a state trooper come and drop off a speed monitor and actually park it right in front of my house, which it sits in kind of at a point where it's the first point where people really see, they, they start to speed up because they want to get there. Um, going in. Going in. Yep, and so I am um, the A-frame in the lower row. Mm -hmm. um, and so right as you come to that point, it significantly <coughs> impacts traffic when we have A, something kind of coming into the road, whether it's our car or um, the speed speedometer. But it's improved, there, there will always be speeders, like even with the speedometer, and we recognize that, but the improvement that we've seen when it's there has been significant. Um, I have two little kids, and we have collectively many pets, um, older kids, um, and often on bikes and skateboards, and, um, you know, we teach our kids to stay out of the road. I have cones up um, most of the time, but, you know, because we've become a seasonal destination, like not just seasonal, I should say, it's now become four seasons. Um, the park's always open, unlocked, all winter long. Um, we have a lot of visitors, and... Like, we're, we're happy. We like the fact that there's visitors. We want to see the road, I mean, I personally want to see the road more beautiful. Um, I'd, I'd love to talk about why as a community we don't have another option for biking and things on our road, and we do, but I'd love to see even more. Um, but it's unsafe. Like, I can't even walk with my stroller on the road. Um, and so we got a nice path, but it's behind you know our properties. So. Um, so a couple ideas we have. We co we've collected, we've talked to Bill, <laughs> thank you. And we, we, we appreciate your, your feedback ahead of coming in. Um, we've, we've thought about a permanent um, solar sign. We know they're expensive. 
um, but we know that they exist in other places in the community. We recognize that the community has a speeding problem, additionally. Like, we hear that, and we hear, we hear you loud and clear. I love to, like... Every community. I know, but I mean, we don't have the police force anymore, and... You never did, though. We, sure, we didn't, but even in town and other places, we lack it, and so, like, the community needs a campaign, really, to slow people down, like, beyond just um, a spin on or sign, like, if we have a speeding problem, then we should recognize the beautiful areas that people are speeding to get to somewhere, whether it's Blush Hill, whether it's Little River, um, Perry Hill. I'm sure there's a lot of little zones that people speed. And then there's other places where we taught people to slow down, like all around the school. Um, and like I, I always slow down. I already know. I mean, I have a kid there now, but um, I've been taught, and I think people can learn. Um, and so where we thought about the removable speed bumps, the solar sign, solar speedometer sign, and then would love to find out what it would take to get additional um, speed limit signs, signage, just like share the road, slow down, um, 25 miles per hour. The whole road's 25 miles per hour. But if I walk it, the signs are, people don't know that. The second that they drive by the first one that's hidden by a bush, I mean, I'll, gladly send my husband down there to weed block it, but like, that isn't my job. And, um, but I wanna keep my family and, and pets and things safe. And so, you know, we wanna see the road more beautiful, we wanna see it used, but we also like wanna be supportive in um, how to communicate to people beyond us shouting or <laughs> parking our car or. Throwing Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I never did that. <laughs> Um, so that's my piece. You want to add anything? You pretty much covered everything. The um, thing that I've noticed over the last 15 years, as has been said in the past to me, that it is a seasonal place um, because there are more people and Little River offers so much. And even during COVID, people were getting out and doing more stuff in the winter, spring, and fall. There is something that attracts people to Little River, not only the campground. The campground, it's like sold out all summer. Mm -hmm. Boating, there's probably three times the amount of boats going mm -hmm. into the reservoir these days. There's mountain biking, the trails that they've made over the last couple of years, WADA, people flying down with their bikes, which I love it because when I first moved there, I remember going to a select board meeting and being quoted in the newspaper saying it's lawless lane because people were like flying down there, not as many, but doing like kind of naughty things down there. Now it's just recreators and so we kind of love the traffic. I don't, we don't mind the traffic because people are getting out there and being healthy and there's more like visibility and like you don't feel so secluded mm -hmm. when you're walking, but it's dangerous. I mean, I have screamed so many times, like I'm embarrassed, but like because of fright, like coming around the corner and somebody like going 60 miles an hour and the road is not that wide. And more and more people are riding their bikes. They're riding their bikes from the beginning to mm -hmm. get to the trails. So unfortunately, I feel like something is going to happen before we get these things permanently, but we're trying to be proactive because each year, and I don't think it's gonna go away. It's not gonna get any less crowded. So we're just here again to try to. Yeah, I would love to hear like, how do we, legally i would love to put the signs up i'll be proactive like i will i will go do it i will drill them in like but i want to ask permission um but something's got to give like we just can't sit through another summer um doing nothing okay so uh, i'll take a look at the signs and you're right it's not your job to you know uh, clear brush from signs that's an issue. I live on Ripley Road, and when I get to the end of Neyland Flats, there's a sign there that says whatever the speed limit is, and there's a tree in front of it. And I say, oh, I didn't bring my saw. I didn't get it. <laughs> so I, I get that. I understand it. Um, a couple things, just so the board knows, I, I have tried to be responsive and respectful of the um, concerns that are sent to me. Um, Enforcement is the most critical element of uh, speed control. 
if a few people get tickets, that that does tend to get out there in terms of word of mouth, and people will slow down. And you're exactly right. I mean, we we have 80 hours of police coverage for the entire town of Waterbury. It's what the town has chosen uh, that it wants for police coverage. The village area used to have a full-time police force that had, you know, in its uh, most, uh, you know, back in the 1990s, uh, you know, four and a half to five full-time equivalents. And, and, you know, they did not patrol Little River Road uh, on a regular basis. The town at one point in time for a half dozen years or so contracted with the village and, and, and the village did provide some uh, speed patrolling outside of the community of the village. Uh, the town canceled that policy or that uh, contract and then the village dissolved and we don't have a police force locally anymore. I am in contact with the troopers. I, I talk to them. You know, not every week, certainly, but I had a conversation with one of the troopers on uh, uh, Friday afternoon last week. I didn't specifically talk about this area, but I do, um, I forwarded the emails that both of you sent to Lieutenant White, who is the person who oversees the police department. Um, I have asked the highway uh, superintendent and the public works director to get Little River Road on the loop. We have two portable speed feedback signs. Um, those of you who live in the village often see it uh, sometimes on Stowe Street, sometimes on Winooski Street, um, and it gets positioned in, in other neighborhoods as well. Uh, there was one on Neal and Flats when I came to work this morning. It's not there any longer, so I assume it's back in the shop it's going to be charged and maybe it will be put down on Little River Road. The, the two, uh, we have three permanent um, speed signs. Two on Stowe Street, one coming down the hill from, uh, from Route 100, um, both in the area of North Street, they're both on, on the hill coming, uh, that comes down from um, Route 100 to Tannery Flats. Um, and they both work, uh, one of them is electric, the other one is solar power. And then we have a solar power one on Route 100, uh, just before you, coming from Ben and Jerry's, just before you get to Crossroad, that's also ours. Um, <clears throat> there's no question that when people see them, they do tend to slow down. Um, anecdotally, and I, I walk on Stowe Street oftentimes, I, park at the park and ride and then walk to work for some exercise. And it appears to me that when they're there all the time, the people that go by every day, they just kind of meld into the background. I'm not saying they don't do any good, but I think a lot of people just, they see them and, and then uh, they uh, kind of meld into the background. I think the portable signs have been rather effective. We only have two. Um, they cost, I talked to Bill Woodruff last week, um, I think they're in the $5,000 range. So they're not, they're not um, budget busters. We certainly could buy additional ones. We did not specifically budget for them this year. The challenge I must tell you is, and I, I don't know for sure it will be a challenge if we order, order them, but you know, people have asked, how come the crosswalks aren't painted? Where's the, the lines? you can't buy traffic paint because of supply chain issues and we may have the same situation with the, the signs. Um, the, we can try it. Uh, I talked to Bill Woodruff today about the, um, the portable speed bump that we have. We have one. It's last I looked it was on Bidwell Lane over near uh, the Stowe Street Cafe. Uh, we had it up on Guptill Road a couple of years ago. We have moved that around. <clears throat> Our sense is that it's not going to work well on the gravel road because there's nothing to anchor it into. Uh, when we had it on Guptill Road, it was, it, it was in a section of uh, old, bad pavement 
and it didn't even stay there. You know, where it is now, it's relatively newly paved. And it has to be, you know, there's a spike that's driven in the ground to hold it there. And while certainly um, the bump would be advantageous to help slow folks down, especially that portable one, because it's really designed for about 20 miles an hour. If you hit it much faster than that, mm -hmm. it really causes problems. And we have a lot of complaints on Guptill Road about it. And I would imagine we'll have complaints, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, from people who are trailering boats or campers in there to have to go over that would be a little bit of an inconvenience. But my concern is that <clears throat> we'll put it in and then those stakes will jostle mm -hmm. out and the thing is going to walk across the road and then it's, it's not going to be safe. Um, I think you both live down there. Um, the, the, from, <coughs> route two, from Route 2 into where the houses are, it used to be paved. Mm -hmm. um, the pavement was getting really bad. The people on the road uh, some of the people on the road complained about it. Other people on the road said, boy, it's really good for traffic control. You know, <laughs> cars can't go too fast on it. We chose a number of years ago to grind the pavement out and not repave that section. Um, and it was felt that, um, you know, paving is very expensive. Uh, we have lots of other roads that have <clears throat> much more traffic. And I don't deny that it's a... a Four season destination now. And we haven't run, we haven't asked the Regional Planning Commission to put a speed counter down there yet. It's probably something that we could do to just see how much traffic it is. But again, my gut, and I drive down there <coughs> fairly regularly, is that it's certainly not uh, a high, as high a traffic road as, say, Guptill Road or New England Flats or some of the other places that we have problems. So. We can try to buy, my feeling is that we would be better buying um, several portable signs and move them around the community, including Little River, as opposed to another permanent sign. Um, the permanent signs are much more expensive. Um, you know, getting electricity to them sometimes is a challenge. There's a bunch of houses there, so you must have overhead wires that go down to the park. So we could probably get it hooked in. Um, uh, they're probably in the $10,000 range for one, I believe. And if you have a solar panel, uh, it would be more expensive than that. Um, it is rather shaded there. That section is in the trees, so I'm not sure how well a solar panel would work. I know some of you have solar panels. You can, so. you can use my solar panel. <laughs> <laughs> How expensive are just additional um, permanent speed limit signs? Would that be? Yeah, we'll have to look to see how many that we have down there. And I didn't think to bring the ordinance. Um, I'm if it's 25 miles the full length of the road, I'm, I'm surprised at that. A lot of people um, ask us to lower the limits. Uh, just for the information for the board, 25 is the lowest speed limit that we can set according to state law and 50 is the highest speed limit we can have. And typically, um, you know, all the handbooks that I have from AOT talk about don't go out there and just put a 25 mile an hour speed limit up because that's what you want the speed limit to be. You should, it sh in general, the traveling public typically goes around the speed that is safe to go. So um, you can either do a test with the Regional Planning Commission and have them put out a, um, a, a traffic counter, and oftentimes the traffic counter will show that the speed is a lot higher than you, that you want it to be. It's a safe speed for that road, given the conditions, but you're supposed to set the speed limit at the 80th percentile, and we did this test on Guptill Road. Most That was the most recent one we did. It was probably four years or so ago, right, See? Yeah, four or five years ago, I think. And, uh, you know, we had people on Guptill Road wanting us to make the speed limit 25. It's 40 for the most part there, and the speeds were, you know, approaching 50. So. Um, but mostly we set speed limits by
traveling up and down the road in five mile an hour increments until we feel that that's a, a safe speed. And uh, things that come into play are things like how many curb cuts that there are, you know, how many businesses, um, driveways and things like that. So it's not an exact science. Uh, if we've, if, if the whole road is 25 miles an hour, it can't be any longer than that. Um, and, you know, signage, we typically have enough signs. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll make sure that they get trimmed out so people can see them. And, you know, maybe we can put up another one here or there. But typically, you know, uh, on a road like that, you know, if you'd have, you certainly wouldn't have more than three speed limit signs the length of the road. And if there's, if there's two, that's probably enough, but three wouldn't hurt. Uh, you wouldn't need more than that, mm -hmm. thank you. So if you want portable signs, uh, and <coughs> as, as these women know, this is an issue that we hear from all over the town all the time. So having a few more portable signs will be helpful. We don't have any more people than, you know, it, it takes time to go out and get the sign and bring it in and charge it and go replace it. And we've got highway crews that are trying to do highway work. Uh, so it's a little bit of a management situation, but it's not something that's um, overwhelming and can't be done. So um, if you want a couple more of those, we can try to get them. I don't know how quickly we'll be able to get them, but but I would advise against the permanent signs. I think that they're too expensive and they just stay in one place forever and um, I think they lose their effectiveness, frankly. I really feel your, your guys' pain. Uh, I know they're both, it's not just your road, but I know I go up that road as a boater and, and I have people all the time, I'm trying to go up, do the right thing, and they're right up my, my bumper, you know? And it just, it, it, it's very frustrating. But I do agree with Bill, is that the permanent signs just are very difficult. Cause like, then we're gonna get, you know, Guptill Road, the Inland Flats, we have a whole bunch of areas, and I hate to say, it's partly a societal problem, that people just drive too fast now. And, and I don't know, you know, to me, the only way to correct it a little bit is the officers give a few few speeding tickets. That's going to help a lot. It's just not going to help the people, the transient people. And you probably, on your road, you probably get a lot of transient people. You know, people going up to the Little River Park, people even coming from Burlington, going on, on the reservoir. And just, 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 right. to, just, just to follow up, just to follow up on your point, Mike, and, and you know, we have a very, um, you know, still uh, rather inexperienced select board. Most of you have only been on for a couple of years. Mike, is, you're in your fourth year now. Yeah. Um, just so everyone knows as well that due to COVID, the state police pulled way back on uh, making traffic stops. Mm -hmm. They, right. you know, uh, Danny probably remembers and Mike does. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we, we get a... We got a monthly report from the state police. They're beginning to, you know, it's beginning to creep up again. But for all, all of 21 and much of 20, you know, unless it was really egregious, they weren't they weren't pulling over people because they just didn't want that contact. So I will try to remind Lieutenant White. Okay, you know, I think COVID's kind of here to stay. Um, we've got to kind of try to get back, so we'll try to direct them your way. And don't be afraid to call. That's the other thing that I try to tell everybody who, who contacts me about speeding is, I can't issue a ticket. If you call the state police and just tell them, and if enough people from the same area call, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So don't be afraid to call them. Can, I, can I bring up one thing? Um, with the speed bumps, is there any way of being able to drill something into the ground that can make permanent facets for a speed bump? I don't know. I think there's. I think we need to like think out of the box about this because I feel like, and I don't mean to like 
get a little like upset right now, but I've sat in three of these meetings and I hear the same thing and we're not getting anywhere. Like a partial speeding sign here and there is not gonna really help us. Well, I personally, you know, I understand that, but Mike's kind of said the words that I would say. So are we gonna buy 50 of them? Are we going to no, put them everywhere I'm, in town? Right, and I totally understand that, but I feel like we need to do something. And if, like, the speed bump, the bumps, like, I know that they'll shimmy if they're unscrewed, but, I mean, there must be some kind of well, way. I'm not, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to put an anchor in a gravel road and, and keep it there. I mean, but is this something that we could research and see if it's possible to actually make that happen? Sure, we could look into it, see see what's what. I just, I, I think the problem is because Vermont, you know, so we're not in Florida, so you know, with winter and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we wouldn't have them in the winter. It would right. be purely for summer. And, and that's what, what. But I think as Bill's point was, he doesn't know if they if they'll be successfully anchored. If if they can be, I think it's something. If we have a way to do that, I think it's something to look at. Right. I would love to be able to like maybe research that and find out. Who would be the person to? I don't know. Yeah. How about some traffic cones? I'll just the last point I'll make. We had a hole, and on the road, and they put a cone on it. People slowed way down. Um, we'll definitely take the hole back with the cone. <laughs> but um, are traffic cones permitted uh, during high traffic season, like on our drive on our properties, like like touching the road? Is that something that? You shouldn't put anything in the right of way, and the right of way or the road probably goes outside of, you know, the, your lawn or your, you know, the, the road. Typically, you would go to the center line of the road and measure 25 feet in both directions, and that's where the town right of way ends. And okay. you shouldn't be putting things in the right of way. You can park your car there. I mean, the, the, there's, there's no restriction against parking there. I know. Um, you know, okay. and and we can we can think about it a little bit. You know, there's. I'm not suggesting that we should pave the road again or pave all of it, but all the houses really are right together, right? So, you know, we could potentially, and this can't happen this year, but we could think about. Uh, maybe paving the section through where the houses are, and then narrowing the narrowing the, the traveled lanes. Um, you know, um, there are uh, optical illusions, if you will, that are often done now on roadways, where um, even with painted lines, you know, the lines are going parallel like this, and then they just bring the lines in, and then they go back out, and. The, the traveling public sees that narrowed uh, painted line and they typically slow down. You could do the same thing with a curb. And again, I'm not promising that we can do it, but we can think about it. Um, we're going to be repaving Stowe Street this year. The state is supposed to be doing something. So Bill, would like that. To me, pavement would make up for me. A Antidotally, I think it would make the problem worse. No. No. You well, if you so. paved it, if you yeah. paved it, you made it narrow. Speed bumps. Yeah. 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 If you paved it, made it narrow, and then you could put a speed bump in there or a speed table in there, and then you know, right in that section where the houses are, where mm -hmm. I'm sure they're most concerned about. I mean, I nobody wants them speeding further down the road either. But right. there's no way we can do this the whole right. time. Right. The, the, the populated area. I mean, I think like. In a perfect world, we would have a path that like the community could use, like a bike lane or something. Like we have an amazing street. Like we really do. It's such a it's such an asset to Waterbury. Like I know that's not gonna happen this year. <laughs> but um, you know, I feel like like that could be a part of the consideration is that there are really dangerous curves. We have bikers, at least I'll be happy to sit there and click a no, whole I, day. I and, understand. You know, and and you know we we have this, I mean, Steve and I have been working here in the community for a long time. And, you know, back, um, it probably predated Steve, but certainly when he got here, you know, people have been asking, can we have a community path from 
the village up to Waterbury Center. And we have pieces of it here and there, but we haven't been able to do the whole thing. Um, uh, there's a lot of demands in the community and they cost money and we have to balance that with what the select board wants to have for a tax rate and how do we balance the municipal tax rate against the school tax rate. So there's, there's a lot of considerations and please don't think that I'm saying that there's nothing we can do. I think we can look into it, but there's no quick and easy fix. We'll look at the possibility, I'll talk to Bill again about the speed bump, maybe we can try it, but if it starts to chatter across the road, it's going out. I can't, you know, I can't risk the liability of, of the town for something like that because if somebody hits that and then they're going too fast and then they hit a person or a vehicle, then, you know, we're going to be held to that. Um, to that. So we, we can look at things, but if the board wants more portable speed signs, even though it's not budgeted, you should tell me that's what you want. I can't do it myself. I think we've heard that loud and clear from, you know, there are, we all know the troubled places and there's no secret. And yes, I think the not the permanent ones don't seem, you know, more portable ones so we can move them around, you know, that we could have them there. You know, I know whenever I see a port, a one of those portable signs, I immediately look at my, my speedometer right. and see. And, the, and the, the permanent ones work. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that they don't work at all because people do see them and, and slow down. After they're there and you go by them every single day, I right. think you get a little bit used to them. Right. The, the difficulty with the permanent science for me is that, A, they're just, they're too costly to, right. to, to make them usable everywhere in the But community. if we had a, a greater amount of the yeah, portable have, ones, I think that makes a lot of sense. Because so. that way we could get it on Little River Road more often than it probably has been. And that may help, you know, again, it just gets in people's minds when they see those that the sign starts flashing and you're going fast. And our road is, it doesn't attract people that go there every single day. They go there to recreate, mm -hmm. so right. it does kind of startle people. Right. Even if you go down there three days a week to recreate, it's not an every day I'm going to work, I have my coffee, I'm waking up and thinking about mm -hmm. other things. It's and definitely. they want to put their boat in, you know, they're a little late yeah, that's yeah. to get there. That's true. Would this be a, a possible use of ARPA funding? Good point. Well, Yes, but I, I think that I think that there's enough capacity just in the in the general fund mm -hmm. to be able to deal with it. I mean, I, we're gonna we're not tonight's meeting, but at a at a meeting in the relatively near future, within the next couple of months, we're gonna talk about ARPA. Right. I think that this is you know ARPA money should be. Bigger picture, Larger bigger picture. structure than this. I mean, it's, and I haven't done a, a budget review. I mean, it is a challenging year budget wise. We, we may have some capacity on, from the side of uh, personnel. Um, I'm getting ready to advertise for the community service officer position. Uh, I'm hoping that because it's a full-time position and because it has benefits that there will be people that are interested in that position. It was funded from July through the end of the year. We're probably not going to have somebody ready to go for July. I'm hoping we get applicants because when we tried a couple of years ago, part-time positions with a pretty good pay rate, we had zero applicants. But the challenge for our budgets this year is all on the fuel oil side of things. Mm -hmm. Diesel fuels over $5 a gallon now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure we're quite paying it yet because we have diesel fuel dropped in our own tank. But gasoline is way up. Um, other um, consumables are up. When we start to haul in sand and gravel from the, the pit and we have to hire people who drive Mack trucks, they're paying $5 a gallon or more. So we are gonna have some pressure on the budget, but I think that given 
we have a over a five million dollar budget, you know, we can probably withstand a ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar hit and figure it out. So well, it seems to make sense to want to move forward potentially with two. So we want to make a motion to expend X number of dollars for purchase of X number of signs. Well, I don't know the exact okay. cost of the sign. So if you give so me maybe a, we can leave it till maybe give me next a week. dollar amount. Okay. Uh, well, we can say up to a certain amount, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And what do you think uh, makes the most sense? Two signs, two plus or two plus, plus, if we were going to spend up to fifteen. I would buy at least if we're going to buy them. If we had five all together, I think that would be helpful. Eight. So get authorized up to three signs. Okay. And <laughs> if I find that the price. For three signs is fifty thousand dollars. I'll probably buy two <laughs> signs and come back and tell you. But if it's too, if it's exorbitant, you know, I'll I'll delay the purchase until we talk again. Right. But if you authorize three signs, I think we can probably figure out a way to pay for it. And we probably have about five critical areas that probably need signs. I'm not saying it may still because there are some other areas we might have to move a sign here yeah, or well, there. We, we but move, it may we, be there. Most of the time, we and move them around, around and, and you know, it will it will get. But if we have five, we'll, if we have five, we have to it will we'll be able to put them on Lower River Road uh, more often. Is it both directions that are problematic, both in and out? Because people stay too late on the reservoir, bike a little bit longer, and they're like, my wife's gonna kill me. <laughs> <laughs> gotta get home. I gotta yeah. pick up my kid. <laughs> They just, uh, they jam it right at the end. Yes. Mm -hmm. They want to hit the road. They like get literally to our, our houses and then like it's like whoosh, right there. So, uh, yeah. But it, but the sign, the, the one that the state police have, does stick out a little bit. And so it narrows the road. Have right. they put that up? They have. It's there now? No, they have oh, in the yeah. packet. Pass all right, years. so even if you only see the speed limit or your speed on one side, there's still something in the road on the other side. It, it does kind of stand down, down a little like bit. It does help because it, it like right. narrows it. narrows the road, makes right. people look. Yeah. Uh, it makes the other people slow down right. um, coming at it. But then we do have like a blind spot coming from the lane. So right. I do think it's both ways. Okay. I'll move uh, that we authorize the uh, municipality to purchase up to three uh, movable signs. I'll second. Can I just say, I, so I support this. Thank you for coming in. I just have to say, I slow down every time I go by Stowe oh, Street. Yeah. And maybe, maybe it's because I've only lived here four years, but I think the permanent ones, can. I understand they're more. I didn't know the price of any of them prior tonight, so thank you. I support this motion. I'm going to vote for it, no question. My two other questions were, I think permanent signs, even if they are just the speed limit signs, I think, and again, I know that doesn't have to be part of this motion, but to me that seems like, a low intervention point. I mean, well, I drive down and there's the stupid stick saying, sorry, not stupid, but damn thing here, the water can vary really rapidly, like every literally 100 yards. And yeah. we don't necessarily want more litter on signs, but I think the point of that it is seasonal visitors and folks who aren't here, I think yes, an extra sure. reminder of the speed limit, assuming it's a nominal price for an aluminum sign, is worthwhile. And again, I think the portable is a strategic investment. Clearly, it can be used in oh, town we'll and has come up. We'll but look at the speed limit signs too. To and sure. even if not speed limit, um, just the like, just slow down, or you know, whatever other cautionary sign might yeah. be be noted. Yeah, really share the road signs are helpful. Right. Mm -hmm. the, you know, there's no playground down. But a number of years ago, we were we got a directive from uh, the state, and they said we don't, you should not put up playground signs. You should not put up children playing signs. That uh, you know, because they research was that they uh, didn't work and they were confusing to people. So we had a lot of signs around the community that said things like that right. that we had to take down. <laughs> but the share of the road signs are good. We can look at that. I'll look at the speed limit signs, Alyssa, to see, to make sure we have enough. Uh, and then we'll go forward with the, uh, with the portable speed limit signs. <laughs> You know, I'll encourage the state, if they have it, to put theirs down there from time to time as well, because that's just one more in the community that can be helpful. And we'll look into this, the speed bump thing. I'm not making any promises, but we'll look at it. 
Just a question, because we, we were looking at at first talking about a dollar amount versus number of signs. Like, as to Bill's point, if they're $50,000 I think, I think a piece. three is, I think that's a good motion, Mike. Okay. Because if you, if you give me a dollar amount and then I can buy one in the ten, then. Okay. So you've said three, and I think you can trust me to, okay. to decide, boy, you know, we can't buy three because it's going to be too much and I'll, I would come back. But and I guess my last point would be, I support clearly if three is your recommendation, I would go along with that. If we were just looking at this issue and not the town holistic, like I was going to say, is it two and you kitty the 5K to be half the cost of a permanent one for the next year? Again, it sounds like this is a better overall management, yeah. so I support that. I just there, wanted to. There's, there's, a, there's a budget season every year. You can, you can talk about Perfect. it. Perfect. No, so it's great. I'm, I'm supporting the three. In December and with somebody Perfect. else. Perfect. Birthday present yes. for me. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> All right. So Thanks for your yes. Okay. Yes. So we have, a, we have a motion and a second. I assume there's no further discussion. There being none. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> we have a couple extra eyes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for coming in. Yeah. Thank you. Motion Thanks. passes. Have a good night. You too. Next item on the agenda is report to the select board results of the RFP for the Hope Davy and Ice Center <coughs> Park study and and hearing recommendation for awarding contract. Steve, okay, Steve, well, thank you. Coming right up. Thank you for coming forward. Sure, ab absolutely. So um, we're making very good progress on the uh, I euphemistically call it the two park study, but it's the Hope Davy park and the park in the vicinity of the ice center and I'm also hoping that out of this process we'll come up with a good name for the <laughs> park area around the ice center. I think that would be beneficial to all of us. Not that I have anything against the ice center. but uh, So we set out a request for proposals. Uh, we got two proposals and um, they were from the SE group out of Burlington and New England Forestry Consultants out of Springfield, Vermont. And um, we had interviews, uh, Danny and Alyssa, Nick and I uh, conducted the interviews uh, via Zoom uh, about a week ago. And um, so out of the interviews, um, we're recommending that the town contract with the SE group out of Burlington. Uh, they're very well qualified. Uh, uh, recreation planning and design is really their their bread and butter. They have offices in Burlington and uh, Colorado and Utah, I believe. Um, what was the name, Steve? It's called the SE Group. Okay. Yep. So uh, the contract amount, uh, the budget was fifty thousand, as you know. Um, the basic proposal was forty eight thousand nine hundred sixty nine dollars, and then they had an add on for um, the um, Arborist Company Tree Works out of Montpelier to do some work at Hope Davy Park with soil compaction in the forested areas. They have a meter, um, they do this type of work on a consulting basis. It would really give us a good idea of whether uh, certain areas of the disc golf course are having an impact on the wooded areas. So uh, that would bring the total up to $50,169. Uh, I've talked to Bill about it. Um, really think um, it's a good idea. I think it gives us a fuller picture of the, um, of the project. Uh, their other sub-consultants are Arrowwood Environmental. Um, they would be doing the wetland delineation. Uh, and then uh, Hartgen Associates, uh, which is an archaeological firm that's done all the archaeological work down at the ice center over the last um, 15 plus years. And so, Steve, the, yeah, go ahead. The $50,100 gets us SE Group plus the consultants, right? It's not, right. It's not additional for no. mm -hmm. other consultants, yeah. right? So, so it's a complete package office. with all of these sub consultants, yeah. correct. So it's a complete study. Um, they uh, presented the project. They're um, familiar with, with these sites. So, um, as I say, the, um, this group that uh, did the interviews is, is recommending that we contract with, um, with the SC group to do the project. Um, they uh, submitted a schedule which um, has the project uh, finishing in mid-December. 
uh, we did have some conversation about scheduling and uh, they actually have a new staff member, a landscape architect who lives in Waterbury, who may be involved in the project. So uh, I think we'll have to have some further discussion in terms of the contract, but it's clear that, um, and I explained about the budget, we're on this uh, calendar fiscal year, uh, we need to spend the money this year. And if it went into next year, uh, rem you know, whatever remained in the project would have to be rebudgeted. So they, they understand the constraints. Can you just say a few things about the other? Um, sure. <laughs> so uh, New England, um, New England Forestry Consultants is um, a firm out of Massachusetts, I believe, that uh, has the office in Springfield. Uh, the forester, forester's name is Ryan Gumbart. <clears throat> He's the one that we we interviewed. Um, young man lives in Weathersfield. He's a tree warden there, quite involved in conservation. Um, their strength is really more town forest planning and um, the uh, examples they gave were, are of um, forest work that they've done in Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. And they're good at that. The, they um, do not have very much experience with active recreation uh, facilities. Um, there was really a concern, I think, that all of us had about their ability to uh, work in the public process and, and really um, elicit good um, input from the public, come up with design that would be more specific for new facilities, especially at the ICE Center. So they're just very limited in experience in that um, realm. Uh, we didn't feel that what the hours were really adequate. It was a much lower dollar figure, but we really didn't feel that we would end up with the product that uh, we needed with the detail we need um, whether it's wetland delineation or other aspects of the project. Capacity just seemed a lot lower with that group and I'm worried about, the, like Steve said, the well-roundedness of the um, proposal, but also just capacity. We know that SC Group, they have the staff, they have the representatives, they have people with expertise and the sub-consultants, um, and that just made a huge difference. And is the public input uh, budgeted into this figure? Yeah. Definitely budget in, yeah. we're, we're gonna have a couple of um, public meetings. Uh, SC Group developed a, uh, a, a Frank is here from, um, who has worked with them with the uh, Department of Forest Pe Parks and Recreation. They did a, a um, planning toolkit for town forests. Uh, it was a contract with um, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation that was done fairly recently within the last uh, few years, I believe. And they're going to employ some of that technique. They, they're they very much geared to being inclusive, um, having a, like an open house style a public meeting where people can drop in. There's a lot of um, interaction. People who might be shy in a larger group setting can have an opportunity to provide input um, on more of a one-to-one -one basis. And um, so they built in a really uh, pretty robust um, public input process and, and they, they do a lot of it and they're good at it. They use technology, they use uh, a variety of means to try to get good input. Sounds good. And are you satisfied with the mid-December uh, product delivery? <coughs> I, I am. I think um, like, like any situation that um, we could potentially get into some delays, but um, we're going to have to have a conversation with them. I had a, one conversation with their um, principal uh, Adam Quartz about this issue and I think a lot of it for them has to do with staffing I think if there's some flexibility uh, we talked about this uh, local um, new staff member uh, who I think would be excellent you know he's, he lives right here in Waterbury and uh, so he may get involved as opposed to one of the other staff people yeah. so what I think would might be helpful uh, Roger is to your point I mean uh, we're hoping that they're able to meet their deadline of December. Obviously, the sooner we get this information, the, the better it is yeah. in terms of uh, thinking about how we might implement something next year. But if we get the, uh, uh, the, the report done by December, it's still early enough to include something in the budget process for, for whatever the next steps are. Uh, Steve talked to me last week and I recommended to him that we have the SE group 
actually draft the contract and get it ready. They, you know, they work with a lot of municipalities that work with the state, the contract that they have, rather than us spend a lot of time with a lawyer to put a contract together yes. and give it to them. So what would be helpful, Steve has given you the price, $50,100 or 109 or whatever. Yeah, 169. Um, I would ask the select board to authorize uh, staff to sign the contract. We know what the price is. Uh, we'll, we'll get the contract back as quickly as possible. If, if it's not here before the next select board meeting, I'll bring it here. But Steve and I have done many of these projects and these contracts are fairly pro forma. So if we don't see any big red flag in the contract, if we have your authority to sign it, and then give them uh, a notice to proceed so that they can get going, I think that would be best. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion to that effect? I'll make that motion. <laughs> that uh, the select board authorizes uh, our town manager to uh, and our planning director to uh, sign a contract with SE uh, Group uh, for $50,169. And if you could add that we authorize the, the town staff to sign it. Uh, it okay, I thought I did, but. Uh, did, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. maybe I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If we have a motion, do we have a second to the motion? I'll second. Do okay, we have a motion and a second? Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion is unanimous. Um, move forward. Okay. That's great, good. thank you. Yeah, you see you. Well, Keep you right here. Okay. Uh, next item is consider appointing members to the steering committee for the park study, including selecting one at large member. All right. So, um, Mike, Mike, did you did I give you three? Yeah, I've printed everything. Oh wow. Set. Okay. So here's uh, three more to go that way, um, and I've got a couple extra copies if anybody wants them. So, um, so we've been working on uh, formulating the steering committee for this project, also trying to be proactive so we can really get, um, we can really get started. And um, so if anybody else needs a copy, there's copies right here. So um, in our request for proposals, uh, we identified a steering committee of approximately um, eight people. Uh, maybe nine with two staff involved. And um, so the first page identifies the, uh, the different groups that are um, players here. Um, the Waterbury Air Trails Alliance, Capital Soccer, uh, Waterbury Skate Park Coalition, uh, Center Change Disc Golf, the Ice Center, and then uh, the Recreation Committee, uh, Phoebe Pelkey, um, has been uh, designated to be their representative. Um, staff would be Nick and me. And then um, we'd like you to consider appointing a member at large from the uh, community at large. Are we gonna include yeah. a select board member as well? Uh, yes, we can certainly do that. That was my oversight for not sure. putting that in. <laughs> so that'll boost the number a little bit, but we would like to have a select board member. That, I'm sorry, I forgot to put that in. Okay. Um, Alyssa, I know you volunteered to potentially be that person. Unofficially, but we can discuss as a board. Okay, yeah. that, that can be discussed. Yeah, thank you, Danny, for reminding me about sure. that. Um, so, the, um, there are five emails attached. Uh, we um, put out an ad on the front porch forum for the, um, a, a, a member at large for the steering committee who posted it. And um, so we got um, interest from five people. Um, Jane Brown uh, from Waterbury Center, Jane's uh, on the call. Uh, Dan Potter, Dan's also uh, on the call. Dan um, lives at, in the Knowles development there in Moulton Farm and um, is a planner. Uh, Tom Thurston expressed interest. Uh, Elizabeth Danu, uh, Elizabeth lives on Maple Street and um, she's interested and has lived there for uh, quite a long time and used the facilities. And then uh, Brenda Caforia Weber, who's been involved in recreation over the years. 
So um, we asked all these folks to provide Mike with uh, their uh, kind of their interest level and some additional background. So uh, we got some detail from Jane, uh, Dan, and Elizabeth. So beyond that, I, I don't um, really, it's not my job to, to make a recommendation. Um, so I do know, I think, yes. all of these people, but uh, at any rate, that's what I'd like to say. Go ahead. Um, before we go further, Steve, could you just talk a little bit for public knowledge about what the role of the steering committee is? Because I just want to be clear, we are certainly soliciting participants for a steering committee to help inform the process, but I just want to be clear that everyone is welcome to provide input throughout the process. The steering committee is just a group of local liaisons who can help participate, but I don't know if you can elaborate further on sure. kind of what a steering committee is and what its role is in this process. Sure, yeah, and, and I think you said it well, Alyssa, the, the steering committee um, is the group that would work most directly with the consultant along with staff, would have uh, periodic meetings uh, once or twice a month. Uh, we'd have a kickoff meeting with the consultant um, and then the public, uh, we definitely want to um, have opportunities for wider public participation. That's going to be a really important part of the project. So we're not discouraging anybody from participating. It's just we want to have a group that, um, a core group. And we, we did this with the community center project most recently. We had a steering committee that was representative of the key players with the community center. It worked very well. And um, we'll definitely you know, involve the select board. We'd like to have a representative from the select board as well. So it's, uh, it's really more, the steering committee is more in the details and um, actively involved on a more frequent basis, but we would definitely want to have more uh, broader public input. And there's going to be a lot of opportunity for that. Okay. Just as a note, I know I've spoken with Steve. Uh, he's definitely leaning toward recommending the nine-person group uh, as, as a steering committee. Anything much bigger than that probably becomes a little awkward. Um, so we do have to, the one thing that he did mention, as much as I know Jane put in a fairly, you know, you know, great, you know, resume for what she wanted to do, but she's on the recreation committee and I guess the rec committee already appointed someone, so we didn't kind of you know, both of us felt we didn't want to kind of double dip, you know, having multiple recreation committees. And, but that's all of our pleasures if, if, if we want to go elsewhere. But you see the recommendations of folks. If you have kind of any, any, any questions, um, you know, well, what's we your pleasure? Appoint someone, someone from the select board and a member at large, that would bring the total up to 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if there are two staff involved, which I think there probably right. should be, you're right, that, bro. That, is that going to I don't think, or, I don't think, I'm saying if you had a, a steering committee of 15 people, it might get a little awkward. Okay, 10, 10 tops. I, I think we could deal with one extra member. Um, well, I'll start by uh, moving that we uh, designate uh, Alyssa as our select board representative. I would, sec I would second that. Okay. Any, any further discussion on that? As long as you're good with it. No, yeah. No, no I'm happy to do it. I, I assume. <laughs> Just the folks didn't know I'm a planning enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> I still love her. So. Who knew? <laughs> Would love to. <laughs> okay. All, all in favor of appointing um, Alyssa as our select board member to the committee? Aye. Aye. Okay. Yes, yes. No. All in favor. Now, in terms of if we're going to have a 10 person. Well, I would definitely recommend we have a member at large. I think that's really important that uh, someone who's not affiliated with an interest group and can look at the uh, community more at large. Um, I think uh, Dan and Elizabeth um, would be the two top candidates. Um, Dan is a um, well, he could probably speak 
for himself. He's here, uh, so I shouldn't speak for Dan. Hello. <laughs> thank you, Dan. We appreciate hearing from you. Yeah, thank you for your time tonight. Um, but as I put in my email, I am a former planner. Well, I, I still plan, just in mostly in the energy space nowadays. Um, but I worked at the Mount Scutney Regional Commission, formerly the Southern Windsor County Regional Plus Regional Commission, for a number of years. They represent ten towns down in the Southern Vermont area in the, in the Springfield, Scutney, Weathersfield region. Um, and projects like this are really exciting. You know, I was planning in that area when Scunny Trails Association first started um, taking ownership of that project in um, Scutney. And we helped them out with some grant funds towards uh, demolishing that the old ski lodge so they could get that out of the way and start fresh at that site. Um, and I, I'm also, you know, a member of the community. As Steve mentioned, I live at the Knowles subdivision, which is right next to the Hope Davy Memorial Park. I've got two young kids. We frequently go over there, use the facilities. I'm also a mountain biker, use the Perry Hill facilities. Um, and I think these sort of diverse experiences would be um, valuable to the steering committee. We don't, I guess we don't have Elizabeth with us, but we, you know, have... Is she the number? Is Elizabeth the number? Is she the teller? Hmm? Who is... Elizabeth, are you... Brenda or Tom? <laughs> I think Brenda's out of town. Yeah, so Elizabeth's been active in the community for, for quite a long time. Um, and I, I think her um, email really speaks for itself. She, uh, she's been active with the Girl Scouts, uh, active with her church, um, and uh, familiar with the ice rink uh, with her, um, her daughter's uh, figure skating and free skating and uh, dog park and, and so on. So she's very, you know, I've, I know her not well, but I'm certainly acquainted with her. And mm -hmm. She's yeah. certainly engaged with the community. Yeah. Any comments from the board on the team? Potential at large candidate. That was our diversity. And without having anything really from Brenda or Tom, I feel like I'd, you know, I'm looking between Dan and Elizabeth, unless anybody. Tom's has there, there. Different Tom. Different Tom. Tom. Different yeah, Tom Thurston Tom. is. Yeah, Tom did a follow-up email. He's fine if you end up appointing somebody else. Okay. He, he, he was interested, but yeah, I uh, just uh, we, yeah. if he was here to talk to, it'd be great. But I don't. Know. Yeah. <clears throat> he followed up. He didn't have to, uh, time to put in any yeah. more detail, uh, but anyway, of course, he's a great recreation. So yes, of course, <laughs> that I know. <laughs> Um, we use steering committees at work through the community visit process, and I would say one piece we think about is outreach partners and people on the steering committee helping being champions and leading outreach. So I would say folks with, I know I have no connections to the school system and don't have kids or a young family in town, and I also don't live directly adjacent to either of these parks, so I would echo Danny's leanings just in terms of having folks who could do direct neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor outreach or connect more to the school. Certainly, we all can work to do that, but I think having those perspectives as members of the committee help, so. Mm -hmm. Roger, anything further? No, no, I think uh, the fact that Dan took the time to uh, participate in uh, today's uh, discussion uh, is significant. Okay, about that. Uh, Can I ask a question? This is James. Jane Brown asking a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so have you ruled me out as a candidate for the uh, this committee? <laughs> asking if we ruled her out as a candidate for the steering committee. Um, I talked with, you know, again, the position Steve thought, because we already have one recreation committee member appointed that it was kind of be double dipping to have two, but. All right, well, I'm disappointed at that. I understand I, you're very well qualified, Jane. Yeah. I'd like to say one thing um, about um, 
SE group, I think it was a great selection, but the um, landscape architect who lives in Waterbury is a was part of the um, six person team that came to uh, that is promoting the ice ice center uh, the ice um, I'm sorry the um, skate park near the ice ice rink so uh, I think he would have to have a conflict of interest um, for that part of the study and maybe could participate in the Hope Davy part but. Um, that seems like a conflict of interest to me. Well, yeah, Jane, we haven't really had the further conversation. I think we want them to submit his qualifications. Uh, they haven't done that yet. So I just uh, was kind of indicating. It has nothing to do with his qualifications. He's a, he's a part of that group. And so it seems like a conflict of interest to me. I'm, uh, he's very well qualified. I just want you to be aware of that. Okay, that's, Thank that's you. good to know. Thanks. I think that's um, a valid point, Jane. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Yeah. I'll move that we appoint Dan Potter as the member at large for this uh, uh, park study steering committee. I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I just thank everyone, including Jane and everyone else here, for applying and say that at a minimum, what SE Group has outlined, I think, has three public meetings, this open house, and two presentations to the select board. So just thank everyone who is interested in participating, and you'll probably see front porch forum posts from me and the committee and everyone moving forward about how to participate. So thanks for being interested, and even if you're not on the steering committee, we would love your input throughout the process. Mm -hmm. Be Before you vote on this, I can I say something? Can I say uh, something? No, 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 no. I, I'm trying. I'm, can, I was just going to say, can you repeat that? Before you vote, can I say something? Sure. Um, I've made this point already, but I think this is an opportunity um, that I don't think should be missed. Uh, I think someone from the disabled population in town. Um, who you, who would like to use the facilities um, should be in the conversation. And I think the steering committee is the perfect opportunity to make a statement as a select board uh, about the process. And it doesn't have to be me. I think it just should be asked that if there is anyone that's interested, that they be given an opportunity. Didn't they have an opportunity, Tom, to put their name in as a member of the public? Well, Bill, I mean, I, I asked numerous times about the process of the steering committee, had a long conversation with Mike about it, had a conversation with the, uh, the rec committee about it. So in terms of applying, there were various statements made about who was and who weren't, wasn't going to be on the steering committee. So I don't think it's as, as public as you're saying. And I think if you want to go that route and just shut it down and take the vote, then go ahead. I'm just making a suggestion. That's all. Yeah. I, I, Tom, as I think we have discussed, I think there are a number of folks that are on these different areas that may have backgrounds in disabilities. You know, so they, it's not like they're not representing that disabled community. And again, I would, as I think Alyssa said, you know, anyone in the disabled population or disabled organizations are welcome to participate in the public part as well as the select board meetings that will eventually happen. So I, I hear you and I think this disabled issues will be considered by members of that committee. And I, you know, I know from a few people who are on, you know, subject to being on that committee, do have some sensitivity and backgrounds with dis disability <clears throat> issues. Tom, I, I just want to chime in. I hear two main points. One is that you didn't feel that the ask for applicants was as public as you wish it was. I think we did what we could in the time, but knowing that going forward, I know the SE group is going to work really hard to make sure that the public knows how and when to be involved so it will be even better than that first process and then second that you want specifically you want specific outreach to folks in the disabled community 
to solicit them specifically to give input, and I think we can. I think we can do that, and I think we can work on that with SE Group to make sure that we're asking for specific voices from different communities. So I do think going forward, we can we can be more um, intentional about that. Yeah, that's fine. I think you know there's so much talk in the town about being inclusive. So I think this is a good opportunity to be inclusive. I agree. We all. I think we all agree with you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Thank you all. Next item on the agenda, a report on downtown transportation fund grant for Randall Street sidewalks and Rusty Parker uh, park, park improvements. Bill? <coughs> Yeah, I had asked Steve to uh, make a little report, but I think I can do it, and Steve can continue to stay here because we've got other things that he's going to talk about. Um, just to remind everyone, the town did apply for a, a downtown transportation fund grant uh, this this round. Uh, we budgeted in uh, our uh, infrastructure budget. Uh, $240,000 of expenditures, uh, hoping to receive a $200,000 grant from the state to support that uh, $240,000 uh, uh, multiplicity of projects. Um, Steve was going to tell you today that we had been awarded the grant, uh, but we haven't had a, the grant agreement yet. The grant agreement did come this afternoon, actually, I have it here. So the uh, total award uh, that the town got was the $200,000 grant. Um, 200 to or 240? $200,000 grant. The expenditures are for 240, so we have a $40,000 local share. Um, and the, uh, the $200,000, I mean, $240,000 is going to be spent on uh, lighting in the Rusty Parker Memorial Park, uh, installation of period lamp posts there, uh, purchase and installation of uh, flower brackets for some of those uh, lamp posts, uh, trash and recycling uh, receptacles that will go into the park, six of them. Uh, they're pricey receptacles, $4,653 each. So. <laughs> Almost twenty-eight thousand dollars for trash cans. It's uh, trash. They're beautiful. Blame, blame they better be beautiful. They're, they're not going to blame blame John for that. Yes. They're they're not, not, they better be beautiful. They're not uh, fifty-five gallon drums. The, uh, no. The, the the trash cans are four hundred dollars more expensive than the lampposts. And on a, on a, for unit basis, the lampposts are, are more expensive. And in addition to those items that will be done in Rusty Parker Park, there's a $106,950 uh, budget for sidewalks on both sides of Randall Street, and then um, uh, <laughs> $21,000 almost uh, for a sidewalk from Park Row to Randall Street. We had to make that connection from the park, oh, yeah. from Main Street actually, to, the, to Randall Street. Um, the uh, construction um, project must be completed by April 25th of 2024, uh, so that's 24 months from the award date, even though um, the award date, from our perspective, is June. They made the decision to issue the grant in April. So it's possible that all of this work does not get completed in 2022. Um, you know, the, the, the sidewalk work on Randall Street and, uh, and Park Row, uh, right now that's budget, this budget assumes that town staff is gonna do it, highway department staff. If we hired a contractor to do it, it would be much more expensive and we didn't think we could get it done for the amount of money that the grant would award. So we'll do our best. I'm sure we will get 
some of the sidewalk done. Our hope is that all of it will be done this year, but it's dependent on weather and other things that crop up. Um, I'm not even going to talk about the, the bad things that can happen <laughs> over the course of the summer. So anyway, um, we, we have this grant, and I would ask if you would uh, make a motion to accept the downtown um, the downtown transportation fund grant in the amount of two hundred thousand dollars and authorize me to sign it. So moved. Thank you. We have a second. I'll second one. Thank you. Any further discussion? Sorry for the annoying notes, but That's just okay. planning and former RW staff note that I believe we were eligible for the downtown transportation fund because we're designated downtown. So just to say when that comes up we're getting this grant in part because we're designated downtown. Right. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good planning out. thing. There's only three to be the same. designated downtown for how long? Is it? Uh, 2006, I think, is when we yeah. first got it. And village centers don't get is this grant. Is this our first grant? From the no, we've or got or uh, uh, Railroad there. Street, Lower Railroad Street. We did a period light post and sidewalk oh, there. Yeah, that's uh, and then as part of the Main Street project, we did uh, got funding for light posts, uh, other amenities that uh, included the Some of the signage, uh, sign, the wayfinding, wayfinding signage. signage. Oh, that was all funded. So um, we we, we have uh, yeah. we've taken advantage of the opportunity to apply for grants. We've been relatively successful and have done good things with it. So yeah. this this will be a great project when it's all complete. Mm -hmm. um, I cringed the other day when I was at the concert last Thursday and I saw somebody lean against one of the light posts uh -oh. Oh, God. and uh -oh. it went. So anyway, their, their uh, useful life is coming <laughs> about coming. So it'd be good to get these three really lights mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. thanks. Okay, we, uh, we, do we vote? No, I was to say, we have a motion, <laughs> second. We just had a discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Everyone uh, in favor, motion passes. Uh, next item is retail sale of cannabis from the Cannabis Control Board. So Bill asked me to stay and um, give um, some additional information on this. And um, I think, um, as all of you know, we um, opted in for um, retail sale of cannabis. Uh, the state is now gearing up for uh, licensing. So you've probably heard in the news they've started issuing license, licenses for uh, retail sale, for growing operations, for uh, manufacture, processing, and, and so on, distribution. So um, I attended a, um, well, actually Neil and I both attended a webinar that was put on by Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, that was on May 24th. Um, that was on regulating cannabis, uh, was presented primarily by a member of the state cannabis control board, was very knowledgeable, and um, we learned about um, a number of different aspects, including um, the option that municipalities have to have a cannabis control commission. So instead of calling it a cannabis control board, like a liquor control board, it's called a cannabis control commission. Um, it is optional. Um, we don't have to have one, um, but if for some reason we would want to have our own licenses for um, uh, retail sale or growing or manufacture processing, um, we'd have to have that uh, commission. It could be the select board, like you or the liquor control board, of course, uh, but it's it's optional. Um, <clears throat> we do. Uh, we will be regulating. Um, cannabis operations through zoning. Uh, right now, the only operation that's being considered for exemption is growing on a farm outdoors for um, under a thousand square feet of area. Um, S-188 is a bill, and I'm not sure if, if it's been signed by the governor yet, but um, <coughs> that would, would exempt those small growing operations uh, on existing farms. So um, exempt, retail sales it would exempt them from the zoning. from zoning, right? Not from a license. license. Sure. Good point. Yeah. So they still have to get a state license. Um, so um, I'll just give a little bit of background, and then um, you can uh, certainly ask some questions from a zoning perspective. Um, 
our understanding is that retail sales of cannabis uh, currently under Waterbury zoning, it's retail sales. So we don't differentiate between cannabis or any other product. Um, an indoor growing operation, if it's in a uh, totally enclosed structure with grow lights, uh, we consider that a light industrial type use. So that would be allowed in any zoning district where light industry is allowed, our industrial district, Route 100 district, um, or the two primary areas. Um, and same with the manufacturer processing, that would likely be a light industrial type of, of use. Uh, Bill and I have some conversation about growing. Uh, if it was in a greenhouse, we'd likely permit that as a, as a greenhouse. Um, and, um, you know, most districts, I think, allow uh, greenhouses. So that, uh, that may very well come up in, in the future. So um, Bill and I have had some conversation. The state, um, as you may have heard, has a very elaborate licensing process. It's complex and uh, a lot of qualification uh, side of it. So um, you may just not want to enter into that whole realm of having to create a local uh, commission and the licensing process yourselves that um, might be seen as duplicating what the state already, already does. Um, there are some basic requirements that um, for separation of uh, cannabis facilities such as uh, can't be within 500 feet of a school. Uh, it's called a buffer zone. That's for retail operations and may, may include other operations as, as well. So um, so that's really all I have. I, I don't profess I to be an expert, but. Staff's recommendation, uh, mine and Steve's, is that you should allow the state to do the licensing as opposed to try to create our own uh, mm -hmm. commission. Um, all of the, all of the um, regulatory issues that the state would have to address, you'd have to replicate here. I think it's a matter of capacity. We don't have a lot of capacity to do this. So I think from our perspective, the, zone, the regulation through the zoning process, uh, we know there are, um, there are, businesses out in Waterbury already that are kind of gearing up for this. Um, Steve mentioned the opt-in. We voted in 2021, right? Or 20? 20. 20. 20. Yeah. 2020 20. to opt in to allow this uh, retail sales and growing in Waterbury. And it uh, comes to fruition in October, I believe, right? That's correct. Right. The license will become effective. So, um, you know, to try to put a licensure commission in place and do everything that's necessary between now and then would be a little bit of a Herculean task. <laughs> and I think, as Steve said, it would it'd be duplicative and there's no real reason for us to do that here. So the Steve and Neil would be gearing up to deal with it from uh, the zoning perspective. And then uh, on the agriculture, Steve, um, they, they'll still need a license, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And they'll also have to have an agricultural designation from Correct. the, the farm. state that, they're, that, they're, that they are a, a working farm, right? Correct. That, that's my understanding. Hey, hey Bill, uh, Mike, Mike, can I have a minute here? This is Glenn Anderson. Yes, yes. Just Glenn. So just so you guys are aware, I've been attending pretty much most of the CCB meetings since, you know, the fall. I think I missed this morning's today, but... You know, the, well, I know I missed it, but long story short, you know, I, I just want to clarify that, you know, I know we've been chatting about things. And as far as the retail goes, I think there's some that want to use the process of zoning to um, ensure that there's a limited number of locations that can actually retail. And I just want to clarify, because I know I've shared this with you, that, you know, we're looking to have, uh, it's not just the Vermont, or it's not just us, but the Vermont Growers Association and many others have been advocating for, you know, farm stand retail sales. And, and though that didn't pass in legislative form, I just want to check in with you guys and see, you know, there is a way that through the select board, we could use that zoning to your point to essentially say agency of agriculture farms that are designated, you know, we're currently, you know, as you know, at the Davis farm and we have, you know, a very large um, hemp, 
farm that has been very successful for three years. And it's something that we'd like to invite um, our community to, to enjoy, to appreciate. You know, it's really fantastic in the fall with the, the terpenes and smells. So long story short, it's great for the economy. We all know this, but what we're trying to accomplish is a, a more streamlined path maybe to get retail happening from the sale, similar to the way they're maybe licensed for milk sales uh, through the milk parlor. Uh, for raw milk, you know, directly off the farm. I think that model of getting to know your farmer is super productive and useful in this conversation. So I just wanted to share that. Hopefully we can, you know, use zoning to to move that. That's what my concern was with, you know, previous town plan changes. Um, and I think to your email, Steve, you know, I had looked back and um, I guess it's a map layer that's a agricultural soils. And so I was looking through that. And so it may not have been designated as agricultural um, zoning. But I think because, you know, I mean, we're this 1800s hillside farm here, obviously, you know, the Davis Dairy Farm is multi-generational. I just want to make sure that as we think about, if there isn't a local commission, which is fine, you know, I think we can look to the CCB's licensing as kind of the, the authority to Bill's point um, and use zoning to the point of, of you know, I think on a local level, controlling where it's most applicable. But I think at a certain point, you know, and this is one of my concerns with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and I've been very forthright about this, you know, there's a notion sometimes that farmers um, are an afterthought. And, and I think we need to start rethinking that in this conversation, because it's not always just about creating downtown meccas for people to come party and recreational is going to happen. But we don't necessarily want to exclude people that utilize cannabis for a lifestyle and not just medicine and not just recreational partying. There's, there's far more shades of gray. And I think we need to be able to create you know, a space where people want to come to, to recreate, but also um, so that we have multiple flavors of hospitality available, if you will. Um, and that includes getting to near a farmer off the, you know, directly off the farm. So um, I'll leave it at that. I'm hoping that we can make some changes in zoning to make sure that, you know, those of us, it's similar to what New York has done um, in their social equity attempts. You know, they really looked at the hemp farmers and said, how do we streamline them into uh, getting licenses in their cases for cultivation? But I think looking at retail. Quick, quick question for you, just to uh, yeah. clarify this. Um, you don't think that having not having a commission, having the state do its thing, and having the select board make minor modifications through either via zoning or whatnot wouldn't work in our community. I think it very well could. And, but I'm just advocating that we really look to farms as a means for having effective retail. Um, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. I live right here at Mount Hunger. Uh, we have a trailhead of you know, 20 parking lot, you know, sanctioned uh, parking lot there are cars in the parking lot and, and that cycles two, three times every Saturday, every Sunday, um, sometimes, you know, throughout the week now. And, you know, the, these are people that could, you know, essentially get to know our brand, get to know what we are developing and, and producing here locally in, in Waterbury. I mean, we have light industrial solar and waterworks, as you know, up here, you know, so the I idea think we're getting a little off, off, off. Well, I think to your point, Mike, I think what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't just have to be, you know, a downtown retail, though I do advocate multiple licenses. And I think the CCB is hearing that as well. Um, so, yes, to your point, I think the CCB's process is very effective of creating sanctioned professionals. Um, but then on top of that, if the select board can utilize zoning to, you know, look beyond the sort of standard and that's what I'm advocating for as far as farm stand sales. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your input, Glenn. Okay. Are, uh, are farm stand sales regulated by the state through the CCB? No. Well, I no, I, th I think um, retail sales of cannabis is, uh, my understanding is it's, it's a commercial, uh, it's not an agricultural um, use like a farm stand might. It's a, it's a, um, re, yeah, this is a topic the Planning Commission could certainly specialized crop. Yeah, it's not an agricultural sales crop. Right. So, just to be clear, my, my recommendation 
uh, or staff's recommendation that we allow the state to do this doesn't preclude down the road the town deciding that it wants to have a commission. It's just that October is just a few months yeah. away. We're yeah. not in a position to be able to be up and running at problem. that point. And, and the state has been working on these issues. And, you know, I'm supportive of everything that Glenn said, mm -hmm. except it's not the town, but it's the state that will decide who right. gets the licenses to sell. And, the state and, and we'll have the ability to regulate by zoning. So I, I agree with what Glenn is saying, is that we should not be overly restrictive on the zoning part mm -hmm. of things. That, you can only do it here, you can only, only do it there. But it's a two-pronged thing. It's, it's zoning, where it will be allowed, and then it's the licensure, which the state controls. It. And, the, and the state's licensing uh, regulations are going to supersede anything that happens in the county. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you, Correct. you could allow it in, you know, in a particular zoning district. You mm -hmm. could say, you know, we're going to allow retail sale of cannabis here, there, in this district or that district, right. but then it's the state who will ultimately give the business owner the license to sell. So you, just because we allow it doesn't necessarily mean the state will give somebody a license. They have to meet all those state requirements. Right. Steve, one quick clarification. Phil, that, that quick is correct. But I just wanted to add though that, you know, as far as getting the license, you know, and I'm very involved in this because we're actually automating the compliance processing process or the compliance licensing process. And we're doing it for a couple of reasons, but ultimately having the location is critical for the CCB to then say, yes, you're no, I, allowed I to do this. I understand, Glenn. I, 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 we understand I get your point, and, Glenn. And no, but I, certainly I am not advocating for overly restrictive zoning uh, uh, regulations, but that's really the planning commission's purview. The planning commission will adopt the regulations for zoning, and and then they have to come to the select board and, and be approved. So, that's absolutely, a, that's a process that happens. But yeah, nobody I, here. Bill, I was just suggesting that, like, as we look at that planning process, knowing the October date is coming up, if there's a means, like, so we have one location in mind that we want to bring a retail location together with the local person to do the license. And, and that's a member of our collective. And so it would be a place where we can bring our farm produce to market, if you will. Um, and it's not, you know, here at my location. But the point is, you know, we would like to try to fast track those people that are in the Vermont Agency of Agricultural, um, you know, a place where we have a, a barn, for instance, a location that's on a farm that could effectively be retail. So that, that's all I'm asking for. I think we Thanks. get it, Glenn. I think we understand. We understand, Glenn. Yeah, yeah, you do. yeah I did. Thank you. Um, so I just want to clarify something you mentioned, like the regulations of like distance from school, those kinds mm -hmm. of things, those are coming from the state? Yeah, that's okay, correct. Okay, that's uniform. Yes. Perfect, thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Uh, I'll move that we decline to take any action in setting up a cannabis control commission within uh, the municipality of Waterbury. Thank you. Do we have a second? Uh, yes, I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thanks for the Okay, update, yeah, Steve. you're very welcome. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Welcome. And the last item on the select board is the search, search committee update and discussion of input of our, the top issues of, of Waterbury. I know we're behind, so we'll try to keep this fairly brief. Um, the thank Alyssa for subbing in for Danny on on the selection committee. We had a good meeting with the consultant Rick, Rick McGuire. We're we're moving forward. We think like we're doing well on a programmatic. Um, he, we Rick's gotten a lot of input from uh, Bill on stuff that we couldn't provide in terms of salary in, in information as well as uh, other information in terms of you know staffing organizational I know some some information is still needed to be providing and 
I know I've been away a little bit, but we'll, we'll probably sit down a little bit. Uh, yeah, so just, just a brief update on that. Uh, I did put together a couple page kind of list of duties. It was not a job description. Uh, Rick sent to me today a job description that was based on the list of duties that I had written. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but before the end of the week I'll do that. I did uh, take a stab at drawing with a ruler and a pencil an organization chart. I saw that your email. I sent that off to Rick and to Mike and to Skip today. And uh, I think Rick said that somebody at the LCT could probably put that into electronic form. And uh, it makes sense to me um, in terms of how the organization is uh, structured. And um, I told them if whoever's making it into an electronic form has questions about it, to call me. So I've been trying to provide what the committee has asked for. I think I'm up to date now that I've given everything that I was asked <laughs> to do so far. Thank you. So. I just want to commend Skip Flanders for really, you know, he's been the chair of the committee. I've asked him if he could do that because of a whole bunch of you know, things that I have, have had to deal with, so, and he's done a really good job. Um, otherwise, I think we're, we're heading toward where we're gonna be putting together advertising materials and going out to advertising. We discussed sources of advertising. We added uh, uh, regional advertisers that, in addition to the ones rec recommended, is being the Times Argus and the Waterbury Roundabout slash Reader because they are our uh, papers of record, which is really important. And uh, we'll probably be moving forward to where we'll be starting put, putting out the advertising within, what was, Melissa, what, I didn't get a copy of the minutes, so. I don't have the minutes or the materials, they were screen shared by Rick, but I think maybe if you or Skip or someone on the committee could forward those around, that right. would be good. I, I, know, I know Natalie was gonna be do, doing the minutes. Yeah, um, yeah, I think the main things were reviewing the draft from Skip. As you said, there was some discussion of salary range um, and other benefits and pieces like that to put in. Um, and the timing piece, as you said, um, the next search committee meeting was scheduled right. for the 16th at 7 p.m. And I think the idea was EFUD is going to have a similar discussion to us. You know, on, just in terms of updates and their perspective on some of them. Um, that 16th date, I think, does give time for that final description to come back to the select board. Um, one topic of discussion was also the name of the position. Uh, it was town manager, then there was discussion of town and utility district manager. Was that too long? It's municipal <laughs> manager <laughs> out of vogue. Um, no, no final <laughs> determination was made, but let's just let's let's title. <laughs> municipal, municipal manager. manager. That's on my nameplate on the on the on my desk it says town and village manager. And, <laughs> and when they gave that to me after I yeah. worked here for a year, I said, Why didn't you say municipal manager? We've been yeah. hoping to merge for a long time, but yeah. they said, Well, you're the village manager. Super yeah. One question I know Rick did say, he said municipal manager is kind of an old fat it's not an in vogue it's term fun. anymore. <laughs> it's town manager. Town, yeah, that's what it's kind of where the, you know, and I, I guess I don't get hung, hung up as much on titles and stuff. So like the, that. Um, the next select board meeting is on the 20th, so that's right. going to be a few days after the. Right, and that's why we scheduled that before. Mm -hmm. But today, one of the things that we did need to just, uh, decide, we talked about, you know, probably having four or five you know, big global issues that are facing Waterbury that in the description to the potential applicants, you know, when they get a, a community profile, they'll know some of the things that, uh, you know, we talked, I know we've talked about before, we've talked about infrastructure, we've talked about housing as being an issue, we've talked about do you have the list? Because I know I did, didn't take my... I wrote my own thoughts, but I guess I would just say, one, I found a date, so June 15th, um, and just saying that was on schedule for advertisement July 4th, so following up with after right. that meeting on the 20th, so that could start going out. 
Um, I have my list of what I wrote. Again, I am not formally on the search committee, so I was not <laughs> yeah. at the previous meeting, but the we understanding your input. Your input. <laughs> was, again, this profile piece has some basic data, metrics, information right. about the town, and one thing is issues. This discussion that happened at the search committee meeting was around soliciting broader public input on that. So certainly we as a board right. can have a conversation about what we think the top issues were. And the discussion at the meeting was around both maybe us wanting to have that conversation, but also some sort of straw poll, maybe if Lisa was willing to put something in the round about just to give folks an opportunity, recognizing we as the board are going to have the ultimate decision on what is listed as the top three to five issues. Again, EFUD is going to talk about their top three to five issues at their meeting on Wednesday. Um, but I guess it was the question for us, one, do we just want to have a conversation? But two, if we were doing this piece of public input, that's why it's on the agenda right. for tonight, because of the timing. Thoughts by Danny, Roger? I mean, I think if we could get something out to solicit public input, it can only help. I mean, it's it would be useful. Um, I don't know how we, if we can do both and have, see if there's something we could do with the paper, see if there's something we could do on Porch Forum. And maybe, you know, I don't know how we've done public input before, like if there's a, a collective email address, if it's a Google form survey. Um, so I think the question that I would have about that is, are you gonna try to frame the topics, right. or you're just going to ask the public? Because if you just ask the public, you're going to get you five no, thousand different right. things. I mean, I can imagine stuff. 10 options. So if you, if you, if the boards can frame, you know, okay, here's six or 10 different mm -hmm. issues that we right. think are important, then it might be helpful yep. to have the public uh, provide some input to that. But if you just ask the public what's the most important thing facing, probably the highest thing will be, you know, taxes are too high. Mm -hmm. so, right. No, I think framing it and having options that way, it's a lot easier to assess the data and at least have a, have a broad overview. Mm -hmm. Housing. And just, yeah. Roger, that would be on everybody's. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it'd be helpful too, just to let uh, the public know where we're at with this, because uh, I was just talking with some people over the weekend and they had no clue that Bill was retiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was an it was a thing. Huh. So I think uh, just getting word out about that would be helpful as well. And uh, uh, I could try to come up with uh, some things now. When what's the deadline for uh, framing this? Uh, we want to add the 16th, but we kind of want to. Put it in some ways, we want to approve it here, but mm -hmm. I know that might. I think that the sixteenth is okay. Yeah, I think Rick I think was saying that work. he it's generally a piece he sends to candidates right. as they apply. So right. assuming we have it by July fourth, which would give us the next meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the idea of framing is key. I was just yeah. going to say versus like soliciting yeah. public input. Um, let, what are ours? Let me ask Lisa, since you're here, uh, can the reader roundabout? Produce a survey kind of poll? To I don't think we should be the one producing it, but we could certainly share it. We could, we could post it on our website, we could put it in the paper. For example, I was just going to suggest the new superintendent that's coming into the school right. district. Um, he just wrote a letter that we posted on the website, I'm going to put it in the paper this week, where he just created a one page survey. It's like three questions. Um, I can send you the link to it if you can't see it. It's on the education page on our website. But he's you know, starting his job on July 1st. Mm -hmm. And he basically so said, we could what are, what's on your mind? What do you think are the important issues? And he, it was an open-ended question. So, I mean, you could easily do it as an open-ended question, or you could sort of throw out some topics and then have another, you know, if you did as a Google form or a survey yeah. monkey where people have the opportunity to, like, type in something that they don't see on the list or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we can easily put a link on the website, you know, just, you know, have a, a post that introduces it with a link that they could go to your survey, and then we could also put it in the newspaper. Because to me, between the paper and the electronic, you know, the electronic version, to me that reaches the most people, you know, as much as I know a lot of people value Front Porch Forum, there's... Well, it doesn't need to be either or, we can put Right, it you can do it both. Just, just like it, so. Um, and that might be a good opportunity, um, like you said, Roger, to have an intro as a short update of where we are, uh, why we're doing this, and then have, you know, six to ten options or what, what have you. Um, Sometimes it's easier to have one person sort of be the collector and 
composer rather than trying to do this uh, with the forehead. Does anybody love Google Forms? If not, I'm happy to create a draft that I can share and receive I'm not feedback. A Google okay. Forms person, not so a problem. If you could do that, mm -hmm. I'd really appreciate that, Dan. So does I'll, our system pick Google Forms? It, I always have a problem when <laughs> asking you. Yeah, um, it's not. It shouldn't be a system. No, I think they use, it, you use Microsoft, right? One, yeah. one right. whatever, so it's not, they don't have Google it's, email. They have right, but you don't have to email. sign it, so it would be, yeah, yeah no, but that's, yeah. Saying that's why Gmail yeah. has yeah. problems. Yeah. Some of them, you, you're required to sign in, so you would have to have a Gmail, but we would make it open-ended so that anybody could access in. Um, I just remember when we were doing the building, yeah, we had we all have kinds of addresses. Google, Google right. stuff, yeah. and we Find could pass for it. Update. So I'll create an intro with a little update, and then um, you know multiple choice. And we can feed you uh, our. Topic. I was say we're each going to send uh, four topics, ideas five to topics. Danny, mm -hmm. or we can okay. discuss them now. But either. All right. Thank you, Danny. I really sure. appreciate that. No problem. When so are we going to review that then yeah. at the next meeting with a plan for how it's being distributed? Can we? For the 16th? Can you uh, send individual? Edits like if I sent it to each of you individually, you could write back with your feedback and edits, and then I can edit it and have a like a final draft for the meeting to be approved and submitted. Yeah, that was Are my we question. In violation of open meeting law. I just said it's individual, so it's not. I know. Nope, yeah. we're 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 cool. Yeah. So we'll work individually with Danny, so we have a final ready to go with a plan of by what meeting. things that will go in by meetings. The that's 20. a search committee meeting. So no, the twentieth. Is that too yeah. late? Uh, well, that's what I'm just thinking, timing-wise. Well, you know, we can just send you your input. Uh, I trust you to sort of sort it out and get get what yeah. you need for you. And I have no problem sending the same email four times. That's Great. fine. So, okay. okay. Cool. Great. Thank you. I'll do that. Okay. Hey, anything else that we, we didn't cover, Alyssa? From no, next meeting? Search, search community meeting is the 16th at 7. It, it is the, okay. the contract is in place with uh, the oh, RCT? Yeah. 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 We're all in place. Target date to hire, I think, it was November the fourth. Right. So and on everything budget and on time. As far as we know, you know, we haven't heard any, anything saying that it's not going to be done. Okay. Next topic, the end topic, um, music in the alley. Right. So Whitney Eldritch, who owns Axel's Gallery and Frame Shop, has requested three summer nights, June seventeenth. July 22nd and August 26th to have music in the alley from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, classically trained musicians mm -hmm. performing within the alley. This is something that she did up through 2019 and then mm -hmm. had to stop. So it's happened. What's the third date? August yeah. 26th. I think they're all Fridays. Um, last in 2019, the board approved it, and they put a condition um, that the noise shall, level shall not, shall not exceed 85 decibels. Straight time that it was six to nine. Six to nine. Okay, we'll end at nine. Yeah. Is there any equipment that they have to bring in? No, I think she said other it's than basic. You know, I know it's classically trained musicians. They bring their own. So bring their own. It's not like. Amplified music and such. such. Right, it's going to be low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the Rolling Stones. Be great for lunch. Too bad. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Do the, is there like is there food sales or anything like that? I can't recall what the. Uh, they do. Uh, oh yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how. What they, else? Was they there? partner with Blackback. Uh, so Blackback oh, is yeah. uh, selling drinks. There's an alcohol uh, license also apply. I haven't received any care. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're going to do that outside. They have to approve that. They're not on the plan okay. so far. That's okay. Yeah. okay. Just do we have a motion to approve um, the music in the alley? I'll move to approve. I'll Thank second. You. We have a um, are we including the 85? Decibels again? Hey, yeah, I, I think we yeah. should to have that as a condition. Um, 85 decibels. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. We move on to manager's items. 
Yeah, so very briefly, this won't take long at all. Um, I just want to remind all of you, if you don't already know, that there's an opportunity to serve on uh, the LCT policy committees. Uh, the Mount League of Cities and Towns is uh, one of its main functions is advocacy for municipalities at the legislature. And since uh, January will be the start of a new biennium, uh, this is really the time that the LCT will start to um, develop its um, legislative policy for next year. And they rely on uh, municipal officials, both elected and uh, appointed staff, to serve on committees. There's uh, five committees right now. Um, I think these are old committees. The FAIR Committee, F-A-I-R, which is Finance Administration and Intergovernmental Re Relations. Uh, there's the Transportation Committee, which obviously uh, puts forth policies and, and legislation to deal with uh, mainly highway infrastructure, but buses, uh, rail, uh, all things transportation. There's a public safety committee. We heard a lot of talk about speeding tonight and you know how things like that are dealt, dealt with. Obviously, we don't have our own police department, but public safety includes both um, fire, police, ambulance, um, and, and other elements. There's a Quality of Life and Environment Committee, um, speaks for itself, and there's a, a Water Committee, Water Quality Committee. I think the Quality of Life Committee is going to be morphing into something different. Uh, you can go to the BLCT website, blct.org, and get some information about this. If you're interested in serving on a committee, and I would highly recommend it to anyone who has time to do it, uh, the committees usually meet two, perhaps three times, usually in the summer. The policy committee, uh, the policy committees help um, draft the, the legislative policy for the league. Those draft policies are submitted to the league board of directors, usually in September, and then the board of directors tweaks it, and then uh, it's voted on by the membership at Town Fair, which usually happens in October. Town Fair will be in Killington this year. I have served for a long time on the Quality of Life and Environment Committee, um, and uh, I've served as its chair. Uh, I've been on the, on the board of directors at the League. So if you're interested, um, look at the website. I looked at it before the meeting tonight, and I'm not the greatest person for interacting with websites and I said okay I couldn't find it I typed in the search policy committees it popped up and the first thing it told me to do that I had to log in and I said you got to be kidding me. I have a login number so I went somewhere else and I, I got the five committees if you're interested you can look at the lct.org but Karen Horn if you just k horn at the lct.org if you're interested in serving on a committee, just contact Karen and tell her that you're interested. If you have a, a preference, tell her what, which one you're interested in, and uh, I'm sure they'll find a seat for you. It's a, it's a, it's not necessary, but serving on a, a policy committee sometimes is a pathway to being elected as a member of the board of directors. Again, it's a. Uh, for me, as a as a you know staff person, a professional, it's one of the reasons why I decided staying in one place the size of Waterbury was worth doing for 35 years because I've served on the BLCT board of directors, I've served on the uh, the board of directors of the BLCT insurance trusts. That has given. Uh, you know, much broader horizons than just sitting behind my own desk in, in this little town, which is an honor in and of, in and of itself. But having that uh, additional exposure is helpful. So if you have any interest at all, it's not a huge time commitment. It's a couple of afternoons in the summer. Usually the staff is really good over there. They do all of the, 
the drafting. You basically sit around the table, they give you lunch, and you talk about things that are important. So if you're interested, I would highly recommend it. So there. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Um, as a separate aside, I think Mike and I attended the training and right. they did put a link to, I guess it's a different committee, BLCC also has a diversity, equity, inclusion committee. Yep. Sorry for not telling everyone there wasn't a better time. I applied and got appointed. So, oh, yeah. so I am serving on that one. Um, yeah, the, and that committee is obviously, that's not a policy committee. Right, well, and that's why I would. But, I also but, couldn't find them on the website and I searched today. <laughs> I couldn't find she them. sent the email. I think we all have gotten it. And I got the other email by like, I searched my email, but that was all the passive and the separate, the trust okay. boards. I think yeah. just today she sent Yeah, and, and again, if you're interested in the trust boards or the VLCT board of directors, there have been people, I don't know if any of you know Rebecca White, who's in the legislature. She was elected uh, as a select board member in Hartford in March, mm -hmm. and she was elected to the VLCT Board of Directors in October, and then a couple of years later she ran for the legislature, which kicked her off the VLCT Board of Directors because you can't mm -hmm. be on the board. Oh. So, okay. Thank you, for Bill, for bringing that to our attention. And what then, um, I'm sorry, what, what board, uh, what committee did you sign up? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think they added belonging to that too. And ours has a secret, vlct.org slash DEI. Brings you right to the page. And we're working on a toolkit. And, and again, or their that, staff is working on more advising that, a toolkit. That committee is dealing as the name uh, uh, yes, you know, inclusive, right? describes. Right. It's about diversity, equity, inclusion. It's not a policy committee. It's not something that will going to the legislature but anyway um, and then B is just a, uh, a follow-up Ted Brady who has served in many capacities uh, in politics and government in the state he was on Senator Leahy's staff he worked in the Agency of Commerce and Community Affairs he knows about rural development U.S. Um, state director Ted was hired as the VLCT executive director a year ago now, uh, a little more than a year ago, uh, to succeed Mara Carroll, who succeeded Steve Drefbury, who was there for, for forever. Um, Ted is uh, trying to meet with as many select boards as possible. I saw him at a manager's conference a couple weeks ago, I asked him if he'd be willing to come here, and he said, if I'm invited, I will absolutely come. So I took the liberty last week of sending him, you know, if you want to come on July 20th, uh, I mean June 20th, July 5th, or July 18th. If you would like to invite him, he said he's available on the 18th. So. On the 18th of July. 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 Okay, because I know I just spoke with him on Friday and he said he wasn't available for our next meeting. Right, he's not available on the 20th. He's doing the Lake Champlain Fishing Derby. Yes, I, I heard that, <laughs> which I'll be doing too. And, uh, and then on the 5th, it's too close to the 4th and he's going to be away. So is it okay for me to invite him on the 18th? Yeah, that'd be wonderful. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, great. And that's it. Um, on the parking lot, I would expect sometime this summer that we really should have our W come in and present the housing study. Uh, Steve and I have a meeting, I think in about a week and a half with people from Downstreet um, and Josh Hanford, who's the Commissioner of uh, uh, Commerce and Community Affairs. Um, and I had reached out to Downstreet and Commissioner Hanford, and I can't remember the uh, woman's name, who's the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services right now. Anyway, I reached out to them and said, you know, we'd really like to um, see a housing project happen at the former Wasson Stanley Hall site. Uh, the villages 51 South Main Street, or Ebutts 51 South Main Street is also in the mix. Um, and I tried to push uh, Commissioner Hanford. I said, when you talk to the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services, remind her that the legislature already authorized the sale of the Stanley Wasson site to the town. 
it was for this building when after our meeting we first uh, we actually had a bond vote to to build this facility at that site and i said they've already indicated a willingness to give it to waterbury why don't they just you know kind of re-initial that agreement and of course the answer from building general services well well, that authorization by the legislature was for municipal building. The legislature will have to authorize it for a housing project, so it has to go to the legislature next year. So anyway, uh, we should get our W in to talk about the housing study, and then uh, I'll be able to report on the meeting that I'm going to have with some of the state people and some of the people with Bow Street. Uh, so sometime later this summer, maybe we can get our W in. Um, I know Alyssa kind of mentioned it with a little exasperation in her voice a couple of weeks ago, but um, <coughs> with, with very placid uh, tones, uh, EFA did reject the whole uh, ARPA $600,000 in exchange for the UDAG fund, so we really need to move ARPA discussion up because of the uh, you know 1.5 million or so that we're going to get from ARPA, we have 775,000 in the bank. Um, we've we've appropriated 100,000 for the ice center, uh, which has not been paid to them yet. By the way, I I did tell them I said it's past the 30 days, it's okay, but. I'm not going to pay you $100,000 and then have to go out and borrow money to operate the town. You'll have to wait until we get some tax money. Because we've been, we didn't have to borrow in anticipation of taxes this year because we had that $775,000 mm -hmm. sitting there, but it's running out. We're down below $300,000 in the bank right now, and I have my fingers crossed that we'll be able to get through until we start getting. Uh, tax payments in, in July. Uh, so that money will go out, and then we did have, I can't remember if it was 100, it might have been $90,000 or so that was just kind of going to go to the highway budget. So of the 1.5, maybe 200 is committed. Uh, EFUD said no, so the 600,000 that was going to go to them is uh, not going to go. So the town's going to have about $1.3 million of ARPA money to figure out what to do with. Um, when we did the budgeting process, I thought we were going to have about $700,000 to figure out what to do with. And I'm not presuming to say anything now, but we should take it off the parking lot and start having discussions amongst ourselves and then with the public long before we get to the budget process now. Can we put it on either the next meeting or if that's too full, July 5? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, one of those two. Yeah. Uh, for the preliminary discussion right. with the select board. Thanks. Um, and then what about for RW? Would 718 be too early or do you think we should tentatively have it on for 718? Uh, that should be fine. If we can just to start putting yeah, some things on yeah, the map, I'll reach out to uh, Karen and, and see if they can, if she or Mark or both of them can do it on the 18th. That's Thanks. fine. You got that written down, Carl? I do. Thank okay. you. Is the state police? I know the Vermont State Police reports. Are they planning on presenting it to us again? Well, not not yet. I mean, okay. Uh, when probably. Sometime in Summer. July, yeah. I'll give you the reports for the last couple of months. But we had them just a couple of months ago. Uh, right. Maybe we should maybe plan for October or November as we go into the budget process for next year. I mean, we have a three-year contract with the state, so our budget is really set for the next two years as far as the fact that the state is going to be providing this service things that you want to talk to them about where they should target the ser services more your, your daily work at this point. Mm -hmm. And how would we, um, you said the school board gets uh, the attention, sure. um, 
So supposing you know, you've already rec uh, shared the uh, emails uh, from my guests that spoke earlier this evening. Uh, do you get any feedback in terms of whether they are going to act on that? Are they going to? Yeah, I mean, I guess we will. Um, there should be another. Um, we're just into June now, so usually the third week of the month we usually get the report for the last month. Mm -hmm. So it, they're, they're just kind of updates. This is what we've done. They don't always tell us where they are. They just will say, you know, we had 20 traffic stops or what have you. Um, I, I do have the contact information for the two troopers. I do try to um, recognize their chain of command I was told when the contract was signed that I should communicate with Lieutenant White and he yeah, with the staff. Would and, and then, you know, but, but there, are, there are opportunities like, um, I can't remember his name right now, the trooper that trained the kids with the R. Ryan Regler. Regler. Uh, he, called, he called me last week about a particular issue with regard to uh, some issues that they're dealing with uh, some homeless person who's been rather aggressive with some members of the public. And when I say aggressive, not he's not threatening anybody, but he's kind of in the in people's yeah, face the rest of the park. So yeah. well. anyway, I, I do have the opportunity from time to time to speak directly with one of the troopers. So I'll I'll mention this again to them as well. And just like we spoke about, you're going to be here on the, I should be there, but I know I'll probably be late sure. from coming back from Orwell dumping off the stuff and getting here. So I might be here somewhere between seven to eight o'clock. Yep, no problem. Uh, also in future, I heard from some planning commission members potentially interested in this uh, to contact other people, but just to say that. I mean, it came up tonight with the cannabis control and whatnot, but they were like, oh, could we meet with the psych board? And I said, I don't know, you have to contact someone if you're interested. <laughs> if you are, so I'm not speaking for them, but just to yep. say. And I know I probably should have addressed this at the beginning of the meeting when, when we did the agenda. Um, can we have a very short executive session? Before you do. I don't know if that's illegal because we did yeah. amend the agenda. No, you don't have to amend the agenda. You can, is it, what's it for? Personnel or legal? Personnel. All right, so what you should do is, well, I'll tell you in a second. So Alyssa, just backing up to what you just said, um, planning commission members. So you're all on the select board. You, Mike is the chairperson, but you have equal opportunity to put anything on the agenda as any other select board member. So if a planning commissioner talks to you and says, well, could we come to a select board meeting, it's okay for you to just say, right. if you think it's something that you believe would be helpful for the select board to hear, just make arrangements with the planning commission, when can you come, and then just get the information to Carla or me and we'll be happy. It doesn't have to come here in the you know, I mean, it doesn't necessarily hurt to come here and have the select board say, okay, yeah, we'd like to talk about this. But if it's an issue that's important to any one select board member, it's okay just to say, I'd like something on the agenda. It doesn't have to get permission from anybody else. Certainly not us. You know, it's, it's the board's meeting. So I concur yes. wholly with, you know, any of you who really feel strongly about something, yeah. feel free to bring it. Like yeah. I, requesting that the, the lower speed on the agenda. Yep. Right. And we did. And we did. And I think we have two satisfied uh, constituents. So, so if you want to go into executive session for a personnel related issue, yep. just make a motion that uh, the select board would like to go into executive session to discuss, uh, to evaluate a public employee, and that, that's, what you, that's what your motion is to do. Okay. I make a motion that uh, we move to executive, uh, executive session to evaluate a public employee. Do we have a second? 
uh, I'll second it. Thank you. All right, just give me a second and I'll leave as well. Okay. All those that are still on, I'm putting you in the waiting room because the board is going into executive session. Okay. And somebody will pull you back in when they're done. Okay. So we're out of executive session. Nine, three, one. We didn't take any action in executive session, correct? Yes, no action was taken. And any further business, or are we good to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I'll send it. Thanks. All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Thanks, all. Have a good night. <laughs>